Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lori Chamberlain, and I am the Education Manager here at Fear Free. And I have with me my friend and colleague, Mikkel Becker, who is the head trainer at Fear Free. Hey, Mikkel, how are you doing today? Hi, Lori. I'm doing great. And I'm awesome. here with my buddy, Otis. So just you. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so we are here to talk to you guys because we didn't have enough time last time. We got so many great questions from you guys the last time we did one of these training webinars that we thought, let's just do another one and let's get to some of those more popular questions that we didn't get to answer last time. So we're going to start this webinar by answering some of the more popular questions that came up multiple times. And then at the end, uh, we'll open it up to you guys' questions again and we'll get to some more questions. So a couple of topics that came up. Um, the first one we want to talk about that a lot of you had questions about was a dog who either pulls on a leash um, or is reactive on a leash. Maybe they're barking and lunging when they see another person or dog, or maybe they're just simply pulling you down the street, dragging you down the street. So a lot of you wanted to know, um, how do we deal with that? So for this, I'm gonna turn this one over to Mikkel to get her thoughts on that first. Um, and then if I have anything to add, I'll add that at the end. So go ahead, Mikkel. So one of the biggest things is to look at the type of equipment that you're using. So uh, it's really interesting. There's been a recent study that actually looked at the damage that just even a regular flat collar can cause to a dog's neck. And it's actually quite extensive. And the amount of pressure that it causes is enough to cause uh, damage to the eyes and to the throat. And um, so even if your dog is just pulling a little bit, it's something that can actually be damaging to their body. And so instead of using a flat collar or especially um, not using a corrective type of collar, one of the best things you can do for your dog is to look at a harness option that allows for the leash to be attached in the center of the dog's chest. And that's really important because it's going to minimize the pressure on the dog's body, but it's also going to give you a lot more control. So having that front clip option gently deters pulling and it helps you to have greater directional control, which is also helpful not only for the pulling, but say that you have a dog that is really reactive to other people or to um, other dogs on leash, that's a great way to be able to redirect their attention and the way that their body is orienting. So that way, if they do start to react and you need to move away from that situation, you can do that and, and turn your dog's entire body to move with you versus if they are pulling and reacting on that flat collar, they can still be turning and still reacting even as you're moving away. So it just gives you a lot more control and helps you to refocus your dog's attention. Um, so looking at that as, as really kind of the first go-to. And then secondly, what we want to do is we want to make pulling on leash not as fun for the dog. And we can do that in a way by whenever the dog does pull on leash, that, that stops that forward progress. So that's where uh, a tight leash is like that red light, we stop in place. Some dogs get really stuck on that. So if you have a dog that does get stuck where they just, you know, you, you've stopped, you're just waiting, 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 it's taken a really long time. Sometimes you can also back up slowly. So that's what I'll do if I have a dog that's uh, really just stuck way out there. I'll just start to back up slowly until I get that little bit of slack in the leash, the dog turns towards me, good. And then we can start to walk forward in that direction again. So that's a helpful way if you have a dog that really does just get stuck. But what we wanna do is we wanna make that loose leash really reinforcing. We want that to be become really their go-to. And some ways that you can do that is uh, anytime your dog just naturally gives you eye contact or orients their body to you on the walk, that's a perfect opportunity to provide a reward. So having a treat pouch on you where you can give your dog multiple small treats while you're out and about, anytime they tune in with you, they look towards you, or if they're just walking on that nice uh, loose leash and have some slack next to you, that's a perfect opportunity to reward them. But also remember that you can use aspects in the environment to reward your dog. So say that your dog is really interested in uh, sniffing this, this smell concentrated area of like this bush or this patch of grass. You can actually reward your dog with the release to go sniff that area and walking, walking faster towards that area for your dog giving you that momentary focus. So you can look at a lot of ways that you can reward your dog that are just naturally around you. Uh, or even say, say that you have a dog that loves people. Like I live in an apartment complex, there are lots of people around and lots of people want to say hi to my dogs. And if it's a person that I know my dog really wants to see, 
um, that's where I can actually use the opportunity to greet that person um, as, as a reward for that calm, relaxed behavior. So my dog orienting their body towards me, looking in my direction first, that can be the release with, oh, like, okay, free dog or say hi, whatever my release might be. So you can use rewards in the environment to really reinforce that calmer behavior. And then when we look at dogs being reactive on leash, uh, we really want to look at the emotional state of the dog. A lot of times there is underlying fear and anxiety, and it's really an emotional outpour. So what you're seeing is just uh, some of the symptoms of really what's a, a bigger problem going on beneath the surface. And that's where we want to change the way that our dog feels in that situation. So a lot of times it feels really out of control. It's scary for them. And the reason why they're barking is it's just like, you know, sometimes the dog may be startling or maybe startled. So it's just like that initial like woof, 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 you know, to alert to something changing. But when our dog is really reactive, they just still keep going. Um, what we want to do is we want to change their emotional response when they see that person or that dog or whatever it is that may incite that barking. We want to instead ha provide a better emotional response so that when they see that thing, they actually feel like, oh, that kind of calm, happy anticipation when they look towards us because that other dog barking or the side of the other dog actually means like treats are kind of going to rain down from the sky. That's where we can play the find it game where uh, as soon as they see the other dog, hey, find it, or we toss out some treats for them. Or um, with my dog Otis here, he's, uh, so by the time we got him, it, we are his fifth home. So he's had a lot of history before us um, by the time he was seven months of age. And so we worked a lot on reactivity with him. And one of the best games for him when he sees another dog or person is actually play a treat fetch game. And so this really helps to build his coordination, gives him something else to focus on instead of that person or that other dog. And the treat fetch game is just where, uh, where I just say catch, and then I toss that treat and he has to catch it with his mouth. And if he doesn't catch it, no big deal. He can just sniff for it down there on the grass. It, gives, it keeps him busy and it also gives him that happy expectation that when he sees that person or that dog, his go-to response now is to turn towards me. I like that. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I don't think I have a thing to add to that, except maybe um, you mentioned making sure not to use aversive collars like like choke chains and prong collars and shock collars. And I just wanted to kind of expand on why we don't want to do that because they, they do become the go-to to a lot of people. So a lot of times what we find is that collars like that, although they stop um, the behavior in the moment, they can cause a lot of secondary they can make aggression worse sometimes. Um, they can also cause the animal to associate you with that pain and that aversive stimulus. And that's not what we want. We really wanna, as you said, focus on building um, a positive. So uh, we don't want certainly the animal to associate another dog with getting a shock or pain on their neck or anything like that. So do you have anything that you would add to that? Just cause I think it's a really important, it's a near and dear to my heart and a near topic. Absolutely. So I uh, really, when you're, when you're using corrective collars, it, as you mentioned, those negative associations, when the dog encounters that, that um, person or that dog that makes them lunge on leash, they can actually even correct themselves. So even if you're not the one doing the leash correction, a lot of times they're going to pull towards the ends, they're going to get that pain or that choking sensation. So they, they, in turn, when they feel that it's associated with that, uh, with that whole situation, which can be associated with that other dog. So it's like, I see dog, I see person, and I equate that with pain or fear. So even scolding, scolding in and of itself has actually been associated with higher rates of aggression. So people that scold their dog for not complying with nail trims, for instance, that dog is actually going to show more aggression in the nail trim situation just out of being scolded for that. So we really, instead of uh, focusing on scolding or punishing, we really want to look at trying to change that baseline emotion that's causing that problem in the first place. So it's really going down to the, the core of the issue. And as Lori mentioned, with, uh, with the increasing rates of aggression, when uh, there are more force and fear-based methods used in corrective colors, it really does increase the dog's stress levels and it increases their association of stress with the person even outside of the training context. And it also increases their rate of aggression even outside of training situations. So in, in general, it's, it's something that uh, is far more dangerous to use and, and really there are just better ways that we can train it that are gonna help our dog to feel better emotionally and are gonna help keep us and our dog safer. Awesome, thanks for expanding on that for us. 
Um, we had a question here from Jamie. So what if the dog is so reactive that you can't get their attention back on you? And I think um, in that situation, distance, I know, Mikkel, you, you're a big proponent of that. Distance is your friend. So really getting the dog out of the situation away from whether he's scared or excited or just overstimulated by another person and a dog really getting them to the point where they can focus on you quickly. So some of the things you can do uh, is a quick U-turn, um, just to turn and immediately walk in the other direction or um, drop treats on the ground. I always carry treats with me when I'm walking my dog. So something to kind of um, redirect their attention in a positive way. Something like a hand clap, not that's not scary to them, but that, that uh, gets their attention. And then you can immediately then turn their head with the treat. So if, you, if my dog's nose is here, I'm gonna put my handful of treats right on their nose and turn their head with that. So high value treats usually and distance will usually be able to get you to the point where you're able to then reward the better behavior. So hopefully that answers that. Um, Anything to add to that before we move on to the next question? I think that's perfect. And I, I, I think the other thing that's important to know is the importance of continuing to work with your pet's veterinarian. A lot of times, uh, aggression and just reactivity, a lot of times that's associated with underlying issues and it can be associated with pain. So we wanna ensure that there's no underlying issue going on that's causing that, that change of behavior, that escalation in behavior. And also, I, I think that one thing that, that we don't always think about is the importance of, um, for some pets, they just get so overwhelmed. They're just in like this state of sheer panic and overwhelm where it's when they're in that heightened emotional state, it's really hard for them to have that rational thought and to calm themselves down. So if you have a dog that it's really difficult to take them out without them getting way over threshold, that's where talking to your pet's vet can be really helpful because in some cases they're or supplements or different medications that can be really beneficial, especially when you're, you're using them in combination with different management strategies and training strategies that are gonna help your training, in some cases, to move along a lot faster by helping to um, basically help, help that animal to just feel better emotionally. So sometimes dogs literally can have a, a, low, a low serotonin level in the brain where they just physically, they are not as capable of um, calming themselves down and feeling as good as a, a more neurotypical dog. And so that's where, um, in some cases, it can be really, really beneficial. And um, so I think that that's, that's another piece is really working with your pet's vet. And it's really a comprehensive, all-encompassing kind of, of look that we want to take for it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another good comment from one of our commenters, from one of our attendees, um, she said, touch helps to break the eye contact as well. Yes, that's a great, um, I will often do that, well not often, but I will sometimes do just like a tap, tap, tap on their bottom or something, so almost like a tickle, so it just gets their attention and when you tickle them or something that's non-aversive like that, you kind of get their head uh, to turn around and go, what was that? And that's exactly what you're looking for and now you can head the other way. Um, just a question about what if a dog can slip a harness? So uh, Christine wants to know, she has her dog, wor worries about her dog running away because she can slip out of a harness. I would say that might be more a fit problem, like make sure to get a properly fitting harness and don't be afraid to try three or four different types of harnesses. Um, you can also use a backup leash. A lot of times what we do is uh, the, the dog's main leash is on the harness, but you might also have a flat collar as a secondary, a just in case type of a thing. Um, so that would be what I would recommend for that. All right, let's move on to a different topic. Let's talk about um, a question that a lot of you had was about cats and dogs. So uh, either whether it's the dog isn't getting along with the cat or the dog is chasing the cat or um, you, you are about to introduce a new cat into the household or a new dog into the household, how can we help dogs and cats to get along better or to live more in harmony? So this one, um, I have some personal recent experience in this area with uh, my border collie, Blink, and my boyfriend's cat. Um, so Blink had some fear of the cat initially and uh, that manifested itself in him being clingy to me, um, kind of being really close and cuddly. And eventually that fear kind of ramped up into aggression. So I wanted to really obviously deal with that um, quickly before that got out of hand. So first and foremost, I think with cats and dogs, I would highly, highly recommend if you don't have a cat tree to get at least one or two cat trees. 
um, for multiple reasons. One is that cats are natural climbers, they love to climb, and the cat tree helps fulfill that need, especially for an indoor cat who's not going to be out climbing trees and things on their day-to-day -day life. A cat tree will help with that, but also, more importantly, it will help the cat by giving them a safe place where they can be up and away from the dog, out of harm's way, um, the cat, anytime they choose, they have that freedom to kind of get away from the dog. And I think that's really important. That can help solve a lot of problems almost overnight, just them having that freedom to get away anytime they want to. So um, getting a cat tree, but also then really working on making that cat tree the, your cat's most favorite place to be in the entire world. So some of the things that we did, uh, we put a warm, soft, fleecy blanket folded it, put it up on the very top level of the cat tree. You can put also a comfy cat bed. They love soft and warm. Um, so um, using some of your favorite, your cat's favorite treats, so sprinkling a couple treats up there on that top level. Uh, we started feeding the cat all of her meals up on the high level of the cat tree as well. Um, and then we sprayed the cat level with either catnip or a pheromone called feel a scratch to kind of attract her to be to really make that top level of the cat tree a, a super um, valuable place to be. And that ended up uh, really having the side benefit of replacing a lot of other behaviors such as jumping on the counter or um, places that we wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily want her, but it also gave her a safe place uh, away from the dogs. So a couple of other things that you can do for cats and dogs besides a cat tree, making sure that they have time apart from each other every day. So sometimes, uh, you know, for an hour or so a day, either put the dog in a crate or behind, um, behind a gate or in a, in a separate room from the cat uh, with a Kong, with a frozen Kong or a frozen treat that they can really enjoy so that they know they're not being punished. Um, it's kind of their safe space. And then you can turn the tables and do the same thing with the cat. So maybe the cat spends an hour or so in a room with a closed door with a lot of cat treats where you hide, uh, hide the cat's meal. The cat can have a little treasure hunt while the dogs can't get at her. And I think that can be really important for animals to have alone time every day away from each other where the cat or the dog is the center of the human's attention uh, for a while, every single day. Even if it's just for an hour or two hours, I think that's important. Um, another thing that, that I wanted to do is address it training-wise from a training standpoint. So I wanted the cat, instead of the cat being a cue to the dog that it's time to chase or it's time to um, bark and lunge and zoom away at the cat, I wanted to turn that cat into a cue to orient to me to get a treat. So um, using desensitization and counter conditioning, I would slowly change the dog's attitude about the cat. So really having treats um, available at, in, in all the rooms or carrying them with you. And then every time the cat happens to wander by, toss a treat to the dog if the dog isn't nearby. So it really quickly becomes the dog notices the cat, looks at you, great, here's a treat. Um, and I, in my case, I marked that with a good. Every time the cat appears, it's good, here's a treat. So the dog is learning pretty quickly that the cat equals yummy things for me and there's no need to bark and lunge. Um, a lot of times the chasing behavior, we're, we're fighting against instinct, right? Whether it's a cat or a dog, that instinct to chase another animal is strong. So we really wanna bring out the high value um, treats for that. So hot dogs and you know turkey dogs and, and uh, deli meat and really high value stuff that smells good that, um, that can, to convince the dog that, you know, looking at me and orienting to me is a really good thing. So those were kind of the steps that I took to help dogs and cats get along. Um, do you have anything that, that you would add to that? Any other tips, Mikkel? Oh, those, those were great tips. Thanks for sharing those, Lori. I, I know, so as you mentioned, the part with the cat tree, I, I think that that's so important, giving cats those high spaces where they can go to get away. And it also gives them options rather than having to run across the, the room or running up the stairs, for instance, have to get away. Instead, if they can just climb up, that's so much easier. So it gives the cat more peace of mind when they can more easily just climb out of the way versus having to sprint and run. And whenever the cat runs, that's going to incite that chase sequence. So that's where we want to try and prevent that from happening in the first place by helping that cat to feel calm and comfortable enough to still stay in their own space and that they can just climb up to get away 
You can also look at, so in addition to cat trees, you can also look at other ways to modify your cat's environment. So there, uh, you can use different cat shelving or different perches for your cat. So just other ways that they can get up and, and move out of the way. You can also do things like having the couch pulled out just a little ways from the wall, uh, especially if you have uh, larger dogs. It allows the cat to kind of move back there and to feel a little bit more comfortable and safe if they ever need to move out of the way. So giving them other options to go to rather than having to dash out of the entire room if they're feeling unsafe. Um, so that's one way to help prevent that chase sequence. And you can also, especially if you have a dog that is a prone to chasing, that's where using barriers is really important. So looking at, um, so you may have baby gates, for instance, and they actually have some where there's a small enough opening that only the cat can move through. Or there are actually some real, really cool things that you can put right in your door that have openings that are large enough only for the cat to move through, but will keep the dog out. So there are different ways that you can allow the cat access to certain rooms where they can just go into that area if they just need time it's to time get away. To get away. Yeah. So that's oh, another thing wow. wow. Excellent, thank you. Um, one of our commenters asked, could we do the same things with squirrels as we do with cats? So yes, um, you can, I assume you mean, can you turn the squirrel into a cue that means orient to me and don't chase the squirrel? Yes, but just realize that most squirrels live outside. So <laughs> there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of reinforcers out there. So seeing things from the dog point of view, um, wanting to chase the squirrel is really reinforcing. So you may have to start at quite a distance at first. So if the squirrel is anywhere nearby, it's probably very likely to be hard enough to find something that's more reinforcing than chasing the squirrel. But if you can, and you do, and you're successful at that, then yes, you definitely can turn that into a cue. But I would say distance is your friend when you can. So keeping the dog on a long line and then um, working to desensitize. Because I don't think we can ever get that instinct completely out of them, nor would we want to. But we can certainly, um, change there, change that. Um, okay, let's see. Lots of questions here. Let's take a question about golden retriever puppy. My three month old golden retriever puppy will sometimes growl and try to bite me hard. How do we fix that? You wanna, do you wanna take that one and then I'll jump in, Mikkel? Yeah, so, so um... In some ways, that could be some normal puppy behavior, but I would also um, put in there that if if it's if your puppy is seeming really serious about it, or because uh, sometimes you can see some um, some signs, okay, this is just not quite normal puppy stuff. That's where it is really important to reach out to your pet's vet and also to a trainer. Uh, and I think the earlier that you can do that, really, the better um, to address some of those issues. But when we look at, um, at biting, um, for instance, and like what is uh, typically puppy mouthing, sometimes puppies can get really overstimulated and they can get really excited, especially when it's like close to nap time, they're really tired. It's almost like that toddler who like uh, goes kind of crazy right before nap time and that's when they're more prone to throwing a fit or running around and being crazy. Same thing with our dogs. That's where using that management can be really helpful. So giving our, our puppy their own space to go to when they're tired and helping them to kind of settle down and relax. Because sometimes when they don't want to nap, they're going to do everything they can to stay awake. And one way they can do that is by getting a reaction out of their person and, and by also puppies mouth because it's their way of learning to interact with their environment and they're continually learning. So one thing that they learn is what's called bite inhibition and that's how they learn to be careful with their mouth and how hard to bite down. And they learn that from their, their mother, from their litter mates and from other puppies that they interact with. One really um, beneficial thing to look at is looking to see if there are any socialization opportunities for your puppy. And while there may not be the traditional puppy socialization classes right now, uh, where people are going in with their puppies to classes, um, there are a lot of opportunities where people can still socialize their puppies in other avenues. So looking to see, you know, maybe your veterinary hospital or maybe the trainers that are in your area, maybe they have their own socialization options where even if you can't go in with your puppy, they still are able to supervise and have those play times. Because I think the best teacher of uh, for our dogs of learning to use their mouth more carefully is actually through other dogs. So that's really helpful. Uh, but really supplying those, those toy alternatives to your puppy that they can gnaw on instead. And when they do do that biting, we want to not be exciting. We want to freeze like a statue uh, whenever possible. 
And then, you know, if you have a baby, baby gate or puppy gate up, that's where you can step over it and walk away if your puppy just continually um, goes for that mouthing. But we really would just want to try and, and prevent it in the first place by giving them those proper naps, redirecting them to those toys, and really, really rewarding them and praising them when they're, they're using their mouth on the right types of items. Great. Those are, those are great ideas. Um, the one thing I would add to that, I guess, is if it's, if it seems really like not puppy mouthing, but if it's, if they're really biting you hard, like if there seems to be an aggression component to it, um, if it, it seems to be, you know, a really hard bite or the puppy's not letting go, then that's when you want to probably talk to your veterinarian or a veterinary behaviorist, get them involved because, um, for a very young puppy to be showing true aggression, they're not likely to grow out of it on their own. So that's something that we want to get. So telling the difference between true aggression and just normal puppy mouthing, um, that can be important too. So it was a question here from Lovina about our squeak toys like Wubba's. Um, that's a, a Kong toy with a kind of a squeaky tennis ball type thing in it. Bad for dogs that have this high prey drive toward a cat and will it reinforce that? So actually, I wanted to kind of answer that. I've actually used that. I use them a lot, actually. I do have the Border Collie with the, the kind of high prey drive. He loves toys. So I have taught him uh, grab onto that Wubba and tug on that Wubba as an alternative for all kinds of things. Um, so redirecting that drive onto the toy. And he's to the point now where he will, if it's not the cat, um, when I first brought home his sister, a little puppy, he would he would kind of lip curl and snarl a little bit, a little bit of resource guarding when I was paying attention to and loving on the puppy. So I didn't want, I wanted to really quickly turn the puppy into a cue that meant go get your toy and I'll tug with you. So that was what I did with him. I actually, in fact, reinforced a different behavior. So I turned that, that wubba or that, that tug toy or whatever, the ball, whatever your dog's favorite toy is into a reward for calmly letting me pet the puppy. So if, I, if he lets me pet the puppy, great. The puppy means go get your toy and I'll tug with you. So far, I've got two dogs and two hands. So, so far I'm okay. If I start to get three or four or five dogs and I need more hands, then maybe we might be in trouble. But so far I can still, I can tug with one dog um, and I can love on the puppy with the other hand and everybody's getting rewarded. So that's one of the ways in which I've used it. And I know that um, they can actually be a really valuable reinforcer for a dog if your dog is really more toy motivated than, than food motivated. That can be a really great way to redirect their, um, their exuberance or excitement onto something that's healthy instead of aggression. Okay. I did, I did really fast yeah, go ahead. The toys, and I was thinking back to that squirrel question. So whether it's a squirrel or another situation where your dog is prone to chase, even then those alternatives can be really helpful. So letting the dog, you know, have that fun chase sequence, um, it can be a really helpful thing to kind of get that energy out and to redirect them to something else. So for instance, when you're outside with your dog, one of the ways that you can actually teach him to, uh, to not chase after the squirrel or whatever it might be is to use something like a flirt pole type of toy. So that's one looks almost like a big fishing pole. It has a stuffed animal on the end of it. And that's a great thing to redirect your dog to chase after instead. So I think that um, instead of like just rehearsing that practice that, hey, instead of chasing after that, this is what I do instead and making that their go-to habit, making it really reinforcing, uh, that's gonna be very helpful in those situations. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, question about a, a high energy border collie puppy that they got during COVID and she has not had a chance to socialize and lunges at children. Thinks that it's peer, fear and puppy energy and uh, is worried about children that want to pet her. So I would say, uh, any suggestions on how to help us socialize her without having children out? So I would say, first of all, good on you for recognizing that, to, to be worried about um, having the, the children petting the dog and having them interacting with the dog, especially if the dog is lunging at children. So again, um, with COVID, distance is your friend. Uh, as with anything the animal is afraid of, distance is your friend. So what we don't wanna do the mistake a lot of times we make is we kind of force the dog to go up and greet the strange person or the child and we can inadvertently push the dog over its threshold in a hurry and then it becomes a fear situation whereas what we just wanted was a nice grooming um, a nice greeting situation so 
really um, increasing the distance between the child and the dog to the point where the dog is able to learn, able to eat treats. Um, are they comfortably taking treats or are they snatching them really hard from your hand? That's a sign that they're a little, a little too over threshold. So you just want to back away from the scary person or thing until the dog is e able to kind of calmly eat treats. That's one good way to gauge their level of um, stress. So always keeping treats around and then teaching the dog that children predict treats. Children predict good things, but the dog never has to greet a child in order to learn that, right? Like they can see them across the soccer field, they can see them at the end of the driveway, whatever that distance is where the dog is comfortable, um, child equals treat can still be taught to the dog. So I would definitely, I think you're, you're right to be wary of having a dog go up and greet a child. And then sort certainly later on as it gets safer or as the dog gets more comfortable or seems to be more comfortable, if you start to see um, a, a loose, wagging, happy tail wag instead of barking and lunging or instead of a fear-based behavior, then maybe you can try um, when, it, when it is socially safe to have a greeting. So if you do want to have a puppy greet a, a child, um, to have the child be as still as possible, really, um, and teach. What I did was I teach all of my dogs a hand target. So just touch, touch your nose to my hand. Um, and then you can use that. But again, being really attentive to the dog's body language and not forcing the dog to ever go up and greet the person. Uh, you may start by having the kids or the people toss treats to the dog. Uh, if it, depending on their comfort level, you may have to feed the treats. So it's really being attuned to your body language, the, your dog's body language and watching for things like crouching and blinking and lip licking and looking away. Um, all of those are really kind of subtle signs that the dog would really probably not rather not continue with that greeting interaction. So really taking it slowly. If the dog seems happy and keen to approach the person or child, perhaps using that hand touch behavior because it gives the kids something to do that's productive. So it gives them, generally speaking, the stiller and the less wavy and bouncy they are, generally speaking, the happier the dog will be. So um, that would be my, anything to add to that, Mikkel, for just how to socialize around COVID? I, I think that that's perfect. I, I think also one factor to really look at is um, the movement of the child because when kids are moving around a lot more, they're playing, that's going to be far more worrisome to your dog than is a, a child, as you mentioned, that's um, standing still. So in puppy classes or um, uh, when I'm working with an adult dog, a lot of times uh, my daughter Reagan is really kind of one of those kids that's just pretty calm and relaxed. And so it's been helpful um, to have her work with different dogs. Um, but maybe, you know, if your puppy is showing signs as we kind of progress and, and it does become safe to do so. Um, that's something where they can play different things with, um, you can instruct the child different ways to interact with the dog. So whether it's the hand target, maybe it's just rolling some treats. Um, what we wanna do is prevent them from bending over the top or a lot of times when the child gets really excited, they might jump around or accidentally fall over. Um, really starting to socialize with maybe an older child that's a little bit more in control of kind of their movements and what they do. And if the puppy is doing well and is showing signs of, of being social, that's where we can look at perhaps socializing more around other children. But really, as Lori mentioned, really you can do a lot of that just at a distance. This is great. Um, here's a great follow-up question for you, Mikkel, that I, I know you will have a great answer to. Um, can you speak on the involvement of children being involved in the training process itself? And I know you can. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, so whether it's with Reagan or with other children um, that I'm working with, it, it's really what we want to do is it's always about safety of the child, first of all, but then also the safety of the dog as well. You want to make sure that they all feel emotionally safe and that they're physically safe. So um, when we're setting up a situation, whether it's just even in puppy classes, we want to make sure that that puppy always has an understanding that they can always move away. Sometimes puppies and, and adult dogs, they may feel trapped or they may feel cornered. So we wanna make sure that, that we give our dog plenty of open space. It's always their choice to um, make that greeting and then to have that greeting structured. So to have it done in a way where uh, it's with that hand target or the child is sitting down on the ground um, or sitting in a chair, something like that, where they're a little bit more stationary. 
So there's going to be a little bit more predictability to that situation. And so if the dog goes up to go say hi, or they get that treat from that still hand, uh, then the other thing I want to do is I want to give them that option to then move back and away and come back towards me. So that's where I then may, may call the dog and ask them to do a touch hand target, or I may then toss that treat away and then give that puppy the option to then, or that dog the option to then reapproach that child or to stay back. So we always want to look at the comfort level of the dog and really by their choice on choosing to interact or choosing to stay back, they're going to tell us a lot about how they're feeling in that situation. And it's always important to respect that and with children to always teach them polite manners around dogs. So uh, it's uh, one thing I've always reinforced with Reagan and really with any child that I work with um, around their own dog is it's always the dog's choice to have that interaction. So you can invite the dog to in to interact with you or to come settle up on the couch by you or to sit on your lap. But if they ever want to move away, always honor that choice. So we don't want to hold the dog in place. And I think that's the biggest thing where rather than the child picking up the, the dog, instead what I would always prefer is for the child to be sitting on the couch or sitting on the floor and for the dog to choose to make that, that approach and to actually sit on their lap versus being held. Because when they're held, that's when there are going to probably be more problems. Yeah, I think that's great points. And I think if we could do the world a favor and we all became experts in reading dog body language, wow, wouldn't that solve a lot of problems? Um, if we taught kids at an early age how to read dog body language, even the, the subtle science that lets them know this dog is comfortable versus this dog is stressed. Uh, I think that's, that's super important, as you say, to really be attentive to what the dog is telling us. Um, okay, another question here. How do I teach my mini Labradoodle to not run up to small kids so enthusiastically that it actually scares the small child? The dog is extremely friendly and is almost three years old. Um, I had this situation myself with two extremely friendly Labradors uh, back in the day. And uh, what I did was just a management thing. So if I saw, if they were running off leash, like in the woods in a kind of a secluded park and I could see I was always super vigilant on the trail, so I would just leash them up beforehand. And then if the child, usually a lot of times parents will ask, can my child pet your dog? I love those parents. And I always, I always say thank you for that. Um, sometimes I would do it in reverse. Do you mind if my dog says hello to your son? <laughs> and, uh, you know, to just be just respecting the, the parents' wishes as well. And as well as teaching them to expect to and if the parent said yes, then great. I, 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 if I trust my dog's behavior, and I know from history that my dog enjoys greeting children and likes greeting children, I'm looking at the child's body language too. Does the child seem receptive to the dog? Then go ahead and um, rather than letting the dog run up to, sort of controlling the environment, letting the dog walk up to the child, and then you can allow a greeting there, but really respecting both parties um, Okay, let's see. We are almost out of time, but I think we can take maybe one or two more questions. Let's see. Just let's talk a little bit about destructive chewing. Okay, four year old bully mix who loves to destructively chew, worried about leaving her with a Kong unsupervised while getting her used to alone time. Do you have any toy or chewy food and or uh, training suggestions for that for destructive chewing. Do you want to, do you want to weigh in on destructive chewing? Go, go ahead, Lori. I'd love to hear what you have to say and I'll add to it. <laughs> so yeah, so there's actually different types of Kongs too. Um, so some are, some are more destructive or indestructible than others. Uh, so I would say something like a Kong is a great thing to do. Um, I think before leaving it unsupervised, watch several times. So give the dog a Kong, see what happens. Um, maybe you leave for 30 seconds, you, you go outside the door, you close the door, you pretend like you're leaving, but you kind of watch from the window, come back in and see, you know, how, how's the dog doing with the Kong? How's the dog doing with, um, but I think those really, those those replacements for destructive chewing, anything that we can give the dog that isn't furniture. Um, and this can also be a management thing as well. So if the dog's comfortable being crated, we may want to crate for a safe amount of time or um, leave the dog in a, a confined area. Um, think about things like 
what what does the dog like to destructively chew? So are there certain pieces of furniture that can we use a baby gate to gate off that particular room? Um, is it anything and everything? Is it door thresholds? When is it occurring? Do we think it may be related to separation anxiety? So there's kind of a lot of reasons why dogs might destructively chew. It can be anything from separation anxiety to just plain boredom to lack of available other things to chew to just it's fun. So uh, sometimes, you know, I know my labs, their, their needs were met, but if a certain uh, shoe were to present itself in a certain way in the middle of the living room floor, they didn't have separation anxiety. They were just being opportunistic at that point in time. So anytime we can keep things that look like chew toys out of the picture, um, I think that's a good thing as well. So keeping things in closets whenever possible, keeping if there are certain things you notice that the dog likes to chew. Um, and if you think there's a real problem, like if we're talking the dog is chewing walls and doors and think then it's probably time to talk to your veterinarian and really look at some better solutions for that that could really be coming from an anxiety standpoint but if we're talking about a, a misplaced chewed shoe here and there um what looks like a chew toy to a dog it's hard to it's hard sometimes for them to tell the difference between um what is inappropriate and appropriate to chew on so in terms of kongs yeah definitely and, and any other type of chew, really, I would definitely recommend watching the dog several times, supervise before you ever leave the dog alone with it. I think that's um, good advice. So anything, anything that you would add on destructive chewing? I think that those are perfect. There are other, other um, toys too that you can look at. Uh, even Kong themselves, they have a lot of, um, they have like the, the black Kong, for instance, but they have other toys as well, like um, different balls and stuff that have, have a really high chewing strength. And there are other brands as well that have some really high chewing strength toys. So uh, the other thing you can do is you can freeze some of the food on the inside of that. So that's going to take them longer to eat. So that's another thing to consider. And I'm going to say this with my father being a veterinarian, he recommends not giving your dog chews that are um, anything that would hurt your knee if you, if you hit it uh, with your knee. But with that said, I think in some situations there, it does call for giving your dog some harder chews, especially for those dogs that are going to be gnawing on the furniture or other things. I, I think that um, in those situations, that's where you can look at things like, um, you know, cow ears or different things that they can really chew on for a while um, that are going to keep their teeth occupied. Uh, but you also want to look at those choking hazards too. So um, that's where we want to consider that. I would try and steer away from things like antlers that are really hard on your dog's teeth um, and that are really associated with lots of teeth breakage, but maybe there are some other options in there. You can mix in with some of those food puzzle type of toys to keep your dog occupied. Great. Those are, those are great ideas. Thank you. Um, I think for now, there, there, are, there are some more questions that we haven't gotten to. I think we're going to do just um, one more, actually a couple of resources. One more question that I'm gonna answer with some resources, uh, tips on separation anxiety. So I wanted to direct you guys to, we have um, a handout, uh, a new handout on preventing separation anxiety. And there's also this great series of videos. I think there's three or four videos on separation anxiety. If you go to fearfreehappyhomes.com, you can watch that series of videos that goes over um, why it occurs, signs of separation anxiety, what to do about it, um, how to know if your dog has it, how to get help for it. It covers all of that in, in some great detail. So definitely I would point you guys to that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much, that's good. So we will, um, I wanted to thank everybody very much for joining us today. And I wanted to thank my colleague, Mikkel, for her awesome attitude and some great answers to questions. And um, thank you guys so much. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye.